My name is Rob Austin. I'm with Gwinnett Woodworkers Association. We're going to do a presentation today on making ink pens. And when we go to make ink pens, we have, depending on who you're going to make them for, you know, what I want to teach them. If somebody's coming in and they just want to make one ink pen or two and turn it, and they're not woodworkers that are going to do it for a while, all I do is pick out some from a bag. If I have somebody that's coming over that has never mo made an ink pen today or any other time and they would like to just turn an ink pen, I usually go out there and we pick out kits that are already pre-made. I pre-make these so when it comes time they can go by and say well that looks good and they want to make this and once in a while they pick out one that's an acrylic or something that's going to be really hard and they go, no, we want to steer you away from that. But anyway, if they're just going to do that and they're never going to be making pins again, we take one that's pre-made. If they're a woodworker and they're interested in making pins, then I'll show them the whole process and that's what we're going to do today. We'll do the process from start to finish on how we make an ink pen, how we prep the blanks, how we pick out what size we want, what colors and all the other stuff part there. These are just some of the ink pens that I've made. I've been making ink pens for a lot of years and I just do it for fun. I don't do it for uh, profit. And people told me 15 years ago, you're gonna get tired of making ink pens. And here it is 15 years later and they were wrong. And I don't know who that was, so I can't say anything about it anymore to them. So. All right, let me show you how we're gonna start off. We're gonna go over to the table saw. I'm gonna show you how we square up the blanks and get them ready. There, there's several ways that you can get these ink pens if you don't want to square up the blanks and you don't have that many tools. You can buy it where the blanks are pre-made and just use that and cut them to where you want. There are several methods you can do if you're not making your own blanks. You can buy them. These come, this are average about five inches, sometimes a little longer. That's three quarter by three quarter. Some of them are uh, smaller yet. They're only like a half by half. But if you're making slimline pins, which is one like this, you can do fine with that because you don't use that much of the blank. All you need to do is be to the point that it can turn around in, in your process here. If you're using a lot of larger, fatter pins, something like here, if that thing's only half inch, you're not going to be able to get your full roundness out of there. Okay? So I don't normally buy pin blanks. You know, you can get them for a reasonable price. Sometimes they're pretty expensive. It's a lot cheaper to buy the board and cut them down yourself. You take a board like this. This is Purple Heart. Doesn't cost much money. You can buy this whole board for about $5 as opposed to buying one blank that's $5. So if you cut it up, you cut them into three quarter inch by three quarter inch strips, you can get 50, 60 out of one board as opposed to that. So if you're going to make a lot, you're better off buying the boards and go from there. Okay, so we're going to square up a board and show you how to do that and then we'll come back to the other parts. If I'm making a pin blank out of regular board that's a three quarter inch thick, I just set this to a three quarter inch from the blade and I put the blade up just a little bit higher than the blank. On this one I want it a little taller because I want to make the blade, the actual pin blank one inch by one inch so I can do something special with it later. So I'm going to set this to one inch and we will cut this one in one direction to get it to one inch and we're going to turn it over, drop it down and that way when we cut it over there we'll be one inch by one inch. Okay, you ready?
Let me do the other one while I'm over here. All right. Now we have blanks that are one inch by one inch, which I said are a little larger than your standard, but I want to make some Celtic knot pins later with it. So I want it thicker so I can make cuts through it without going through the process here. Okay, the next step is we're going to do is we're going to show you how to cut the pins down to the right size for the metal tubes on there. So I'm going to get out a pin kit and I'll show you different parts that come in it and I'll show you why we're cutting it out for that size. All right, the process I want to show you today about prepping the pins, making the pin blanks and stuff works on any type of pins. What I want to do is show you a couple of the different pin kits, what's included in them and you know what the pins can look like afterward. So down here, this is your standard slimline pin. This is the shape I like to end up with in the end. It's got a little bit of a curve to it. I like to feel it like that rather than be straight. And that's just a matter of preference. Some people like them a little fatter, some people like them thinner. That is the kit for there. These are the parts that come in that kit. You have a tube that's going to go on inside the blank itself and we'll show you how to cut it for that size tube and how to insert that in a little bit. This is just the ring that goes in the center. You have the part on the end that goes there that holds your clip. This is a cap and clip. Your regular insert. This is a point and this is a transmission. When you turn in your pin, open and close, this is the part that extends it and changes it, moves the, the blanket in and out of here. So that's on the slimline kit. This is called the Sierra, which is just what that brand actually calls them for this kit. And it's also called different brands, Wall Street and Gatsby and some other ones. And this is what's coming in this kit. You have the tube that's going to go on the inside of the wood, a spring, the top, the bottom, and this is your transmission mechanism, which is the same as the little one here. When you have very little to do with assembling this pin when you're done, you'll put these parts together, put this on top of here and get it in. And this is the whole bottom half of the pin. So when you turn it, you're only going to turn the wooden stuff for the top part and you're going to put that in here and pop it together. So it's very fast to put this thing together when you get ready to do this. So we're going to go over next to the bandsaw. I'm going to show you how to cut these to the proper length that you want for your tube. See, you can tell the tube's difference of difference. There's just hundreds of different pin styles out there. A lot of them, the pins are a little different from one way or another. So you're going to have to cut it to your actual type of pin that you're going to use at the time. Okay. All right. Our next step we're going to do is cutting down the pin blanks, the wood, to the actual size of the pin we're using. Each blank is going to depend on your tube. The tube itself that you have, a, you want to put your blank so you're a little bit farther than that, maybe about an eighth of an inch longer. So when you cut the thing off, you can sand it down to there and clean it up to put on there. So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you two different methods. I, first of all, I put the tube on to where I'm going to go to you and bring this up. That way you can see on here, I've got a little bit of a gap. So once I cut it, I'm not right on the end. So we've got a little extra to play with. Now, you can cut this off a lot of different ways. You can use a chop saw, you can use a band saw, you know, however you want to get it to there, that's what you're going to do on here. This is a slimline tube. And then the next step is to cut it. Now, I cut it one method for years and I'll show you how to do that and then you can decide where you want to go from there. I take the pin, the pin blank, put it on here, turn it on, I cut to one side, I set it aside and then I push farther and then cut the next one. So we're doing a continuous line. You don't have a gap in between. When you put the two parts of the pin together, you'll be able to see that line all the way across here. On some pin blanks like this, this is brown ebony, you won't tell the difference. It's not going to match up with anything. You don't have to worry about it. But if you got something with a grain like this, this is uh, zebra wood, you want to make sure that you've got a clean shot so it looks all the way through. Okay, let me go ahead and cut this. I'm going to cut the first wet method that way. I've been doing it for years and then I'm going to cut a safer method that we decided easier and it's real easy to make. Okay. I cut the pin blanks for years using that same method. 
But when you're doing it, you're getting your hands awful close. You can feel the, the bearings turn on here and you're getting pretty close to the blade. So I decided to make a sled later and I make this where it doesn't have to go in a groove. All it's got to do is set to where the, the threads are at. And I have it so it just slips on. I put it up against the fence, tighten up the fence, put it on here. Now when I put it on here, you can see that the tube itself is a little less than the cut, just like what I was doing by hand. That way when you cut it, you know, you're a little longer than what you want to be. So, and it's a lot easier to cut like that. So I'll take it and I'll put this on, just cut it, and then move it aside. And you're not putting your fingers anywhere near it. I can hold it on this end and it cuts there. Then I have a nice clean cut. It's actually straighter. It's actually straighter than this. When I'm holding it on the end, I've got to balance it to keep it straight. I did not have as clean a cut as I had on here. So that's how we cut it. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go over the drill press and we'll show how to drill it out. All right, next step we're going to do is we're going to find the center of this wood. Now sometimes when you cut it, you're not exactly one inch by one inch or three quarter by three quarter. Even if you're in a rectangle, all you're going to have to do is go from corner to corner. Now I'll give you two methods on how to do it. I got this from Walmart, it was in a sewing department. I can put that on and I can count the different lines from one to the other. And I can tell right there I'm in the center. And I drilled a hole in it when I first got this. And all I have to do is hold it here, turn it to where I'm at, and then I can mark a mark on there. So that's one method. These are like a dollar something at Walmart. You can use it for all kinds of blocks and everything. They're really handy. Now another method is the little what they call a pin pal. You can put a ruler, whatever you want to do, you just got to go from corner to corner. Now the pin pal sits on here and it's, it's open on the sides where you put it right on your block, blank. And you just take and go across it and I go through all four corners. And if the thing is a rectangle and not a perfect square, you end up with double lines in the center. Well, all you got to do is take that center part there. That is where I'm going to drill it at. You want to make sure you're close on your drilling. Now, if you're doing most type of pins, it's not a problem because you've got enough wood on the outside. If you're one way or another, after you get on a lathe, it's going to straighten out. If you're doing a Celtic knot pin, if you're not exactly in the center, you're going to throw it off and you're going to elongate the knots on one side or another. So try and get it as close to the center as you can. Like I said, with a regular slim line or something, it won't make a difference. All right, now we're going to go over to the drill press and drill it out. All right, now there's a lot of type of drill presses. You can drill this out on your lathe where you put um, a Jacob's chuck on one end and you put this into a chuck and drill into it. All you got to do is get a center straight line. The best way to do it is with a pin vise. There's a couple different types. This is my preference. You can go out there, you just, you put it in between. It's self-centering because you got angles on there and you put it over there. Now you adjust it for the different thickness. And that way I'm right to the center. You can see that I got a brad point bit. That's what I use. This is a seven millimeter. I adjust it right to there. So when I go down on that thing, I'm hitting right in the center. You can mark it ahead of time. Look at it. Make sure you're in the right spot, which we're, we're exactly right. All I'm going to do now is turn it on and drill it. When you go to drill, you want to drill ways into it, lift it back up, and clear out the gullet down there and do it again and again. Don't try going all the way through on one cut. So. Now this blank is made out of wood and the reason why when we were talking about the leaving a little extra spot on there because when you put the tube in you're going to be about that much shorter coming through the bottom which is good on wood it's not a problem you take your time when you get to the end you don't want to bust out you go slow wood's not a problem but if you're doing acrylic and you get down near that last little part on there and you pull it you're going to split out a piece of that almost every time so you got to be real gentle with doing that and if you make it a little longer once it splits out when you cut the block off at the end, it'll be cut off to the point that, you know, you will uh, have extra there so you won't have to do anything. Okay, that's it for this. The next step is going to be putting in the tubes and we're going to epoxy those in and we're going to go to that next. Thank you. The next step 
is to secure the tube within the blank here. Okay. The first thing you want to do when you get to these tubes, they are, they're glossy, they're almost an oily feel. They won't adhere to the glue well. So what you're going to do is take and sand them. All you got to do is stuff it up enough that you can see where it's dull. And we're going to do that. Okay, so that's all you got to do with it. Now kind of make sure there's no powder in there from sandpaper, you clear it on here. Okay, now I use five minute epoxy just as, as uh, that's been my preference. I use Stickfast brand. Any brand's probably going to work, but you have the epoxy and you have the hardener. You want to use, uh, I like the five minute because it gives me five minutes working time. That does not mean it's going to be hard in five minutes. You still want it to dry about 24 hours to make sure it's hardened up all the way. So you have about five minute working time. I put a spot on the thing here. Now this paper that I use, rather than use up a board each time, I just take a piece of MDF that's about a quarter inch thick. I cover it with, this is freezer wrap, which is sort of like wax paper, but it's a little thicker. It seems to last longer. I put it with that and tape it together so it stays on there. And that's what keeps it around there. And I just tear it off and mess up another piece later. So I'm putting equal parts, as equal as you can get by guessing here. and my half a popsicle stick. Mix it up, it only takes a few seconds for it to cover up and it does pretty good. And I put that aside. Now the most important thing in here is to put on gloves. Because I don't care what you do, I can't figure out how to get this epoxy off my fingers using, you know, paint thinner and everything else. Once it's on there, I, I walk around with it for a couple days before it wears off. So, anyway. Now, you take the tube, and I get this on here, and I take it, and I do like the bottom three quarters of the tube. And you want to get it on there good, so you're going to get it inside, so it's going to mix into the wood. Okay. Now, I put it in from the tube, push it in. I push it in about halfway, and I'm turning it and trying to move it to the sides and go in and out a little bit. That moving it to the in, in and out helps put it onto and coat the inside there. I get it lower until I'm out this far from the tube. And then I take it and the excess that it's out from me pushing out gets on there. I kind of mark it with a stick, put it over there, and wipe it off, and that gets it to the point that we want it at. And I'll take a paper towel from there. You want to make sure that you have this thing pushed in enough that it's not sticking out the top at all on the other side. So right now we are perfect on there on both sides. And I'll just set that aside and we're going to let it dry. And while that's drying, we will get another one that's already dried for the next part. Also, there are different methods. Like I said, I use the stick fast epoxy. Some people like to use like a medium to thick CA glue and put on there. It's not my preference, but it depends on what you want to do. I think PA glue will harden after time. And a couple years from now, you might drop it and the CA glue br brittle and your tube will come loose. So that's just my reason why I don't use it. Now that we have the, the tube glued in place, we're good there. Like I said, this batch will set there for 24 hours. I have several in different stages here. Now, I want to show this as an example here. There's a couple methods that I normally use for cleaning up the ends. The reason you clean up the ends is you're going to fit all this stuff on a mandrel to put inside here when you're done. And we'll talk about a little bit later on how to get the right bushings. But when, when you go to put this on, you have to get this thing where the metal is flush just like this, and the wood and the metal match. You want to do that on both sides. If you don't have this right, what's going to happen is your pin itself, when you pull this thing out, the, this is acrylic, but the acrylic or the wood is going to be out farther than your actual uh, tube on the inside. If it does that, you're not going to seat right, it's not going to turn smooth, and it's not going to set good when you put it. When you put it on here, you want to have a smooth transition going across from part to part. If you don't have that in right, you know, where it's flush, then you can, part of that plastic or the wood is going to stick out one way or another. So that's what we're going to use the end mill for. Now, end mill's got one purpose. It's great on this. This is hardwoods. When I go out there and I'm going to show you how to do this next, 
And then I'll show you a second method. Now on a hardwood like this, you're putting it in. Now you have to be careful. You can adjust this end mill where that thing goes out farther than what your hand is. You don't want to be putting this on here and have your hand over here on the end. So I hold it like, like this and put it on there. And then all you got to do is turn it enough. See? And you can see where it's starting to get shiny there where we're flush with that. I'm going to do it just a little far. Now usually I put it down against the wood so I get a little bit of leverage. Okay, now it's on, on there on that one. Now on this one, this is palm tree. This is a really uh, soft wood that will splinter a lot. Now it has quite a bit. We need to take off about an eighth inch off of that. You can see the tube, if you look close, it's about an eighth inch below here. Now rather than use that end mill, if you take that end mill, which putting it on here, it covers the whole, I'm not gonna take it on, it covers it farther than here. And if you start that up and push on it, you're gonna split that right down the center. The grain that runs long ways like this, and you put it on it. So I'm gonna show you a different method that I use for cleaning up my parts over here on the sanding station. So that's gonna be our next step. So follow me. All right, the next step that I use, rather than use the end mill when you're using something like this, if you're using uh, Wingate, this is uh, palm tree, it has all the shards on here and it'll split apart so easy. When you put that end mill on it, covering the whole thing, it come out. So what you want to do is you want to sand to the point that you want on here. So you take this thing, put it on here, and remembering that this wheel is going in a circle. If you get it, you want to keep on this side here where it's going down, you get over here, it, you have a good chance of pulling it up and flipping the thing across the room. So make sure on this side, put it on here, level on here, and you always wear your eye protection with this because more than the danger of everything else, it just throws stuff at you every time. So. Okay, you can see where that one's there? On the other side? It doesn't take but a couple times of going over it. Now, you want to try and be conservative with it. If you, you don't want to make this too much shorter, with a slimline pin, it doesn't really hurt anything. You can make this thing a half inch shorter and your pin's just gonna be shorter. But if you take the pin, the slimline pin, it won't hurt anything to make it shorter than, than what it is in because the pin could be any size. The part on the top, you have that much room to play with where you can make e either part longer or shorter and it just ends up with a different shape of a pin. But on the Sierra, Gatsby, the Wall Street, the ones like this, you have to cut that thing right here exactly to where that is at. You go any farther and you're gonna look like this. You can't get that to go down any farther because this is gonna be shortened. You're, it's set for that size. So be real careful to go right to the spot that you wanna to go to and, and stop. So like I said, that's my method. You put it across here, keep it straight. This keeps it flat where you're getting a nice level surface and you pull it off. I find it to be a lot safer as far as you're not holding the pin mandrel, take a chance of putting it in your hand. And when I'm doing a lot of them, I always use this method now. This next step, what we want to do is show you putting the pin blank on the pin mandrel and a little bit explain on a little bit about the bushing that we're using. The, uh, the type of pin we're using that I'm going to turn is actually the one here that's called a Mesa Grande Wall Street, depending on where it got it from, you know. It's just different sales people that are bringing it in. Okay, so when you go to put these on here, the bushing itself is different on almost all pins. When you go order the pin kit, it's gonna come with the different parts we showed earlier, but each one is gonna require a bushing that puts it on the mandrel. This mandrel, it normally comes as a mandrel and it has you know four or five bushings that come with it, and there's different types. You know. These bushings here are what they call a seven millimeter bushing. That's the same, that's your average for doing a slimline pen. It comes with about five of them. And you use them for spacers in this case that you're not using, the, you're not, we're not using a seven millimeter pen kit, the you know, slimline. But I just want to show you before I show that on there is how these are on there. This one mounts on to a one inch eight threaded part for the headstock. You put it just on there, and that's one method on there, which works great for this, but if you have 
like the Powermatic or Jet that takes one and an eighth, eight, it's not gonna work for you there. As an alternative, you have ones like this, which is adjustable, and it's a number two Morse taper. This is a number two Morse taper. So the next step is putting our newly turned or newly glued, sand it off the end, everything's on there blank, on the mandrel. Though there's a lot of choices when you go to buy a mandrel. You know, this, I've got like three different styles here. This one and these all take a number two Morris taper. So you can just pop it in almost any of the modern lays for woodworking lays. Now they'll come like this. You'll have this, you'll have like four or five uh, little bushings on it. These bushings are the size that you use for a seven millimeter bushings that you use for like a slimline pins. And, and it's used for a lot of other things, you know, uh, different kits. So. For the most part, you know, you can take this, you use these as spacers, and you put the different ones on there. Now, when we get ready to uh, turn the kit for here, this is going to require a different bushing, along with most pin kits. When you buy a pin kit, you're going to have the pin kit and the parts I showed earlier, but to make that pin kit work, you're going to have to have bushings that make this fit. This bushing is stepped up like on here. This will fit inside of the tube that was on there. And the center part of this is the same as your thickness here. So anytime you go to buy a pin kit and you thought, well, that's really a neat pin kit and it's $20, so that's gonna cost me $20. Well, it's gonna cost you $20 for that. It's cost you four or $5 for the bushings that go on there. And then you have to have the exact drill bit. If the drill bit's not exactly right, uh, right you're going to have too much play in here and it's not going to work right. So consider that if you're going to buy them, if you're going to do a one-off kit and you're going to charge somebody for it, you want to charge them for the actual kit, the material that you're making out of it, it's wood, acrylic, or whatever you're doing, and include the price of the bushing and the drill bit, and then you got the drill bit forever. If you feel like it's a kit you want to make a lot of, well then once you buy that drill and the bushings, you can use it for the next 10 years if you don't mess them up. So, all right, so the next step on here, I'm gonna pull a couple of these bushings off of here. Just leave like one bushing on here on this end. And I'll put this on, it goes into the there, and then you put your second one on. Now the second one here, you can see how much play would be on here without the bushing. You know, that's why the bushing, the bushing puts it in, and by the time you're done, you're running perfectly smooth. You put the rest of your bushing, or bushings on here, and you want to go all the way up. You can see it's not threaded until you get to a certain point. Once you hit to that point, you have to make sure it's covered all the way to the thread. So you put that on, put on your neural nut on here, and you want to just hand tighten it. Yeah, so I'm, that's hand tight, and then I'm going to put this extra nut. This doesn't come with it, but it's just a little bit of security. A lot of times when I'm tightening these things on here, or when I turn, all of a sudden this thing starts loosening up a little bit because it's not tight enough. So I put an extra nut on, and I'll show you how to do that when I put it on here. Now, before I get any farther on here, I want to talk a little bit more about these type on there. Like I said, these are Morris Taper. This one pops in there, and you have to use all these bushings or whatever on here. If you're using a regular pin that has two parts, you know, you only need a couple bushings. This is not adjustable. You have this other type here. Now this is the same type of thing, except for you can break this loose between here and here. There's two tools that come with it. Break it loose, you can make this rod smaller or, big or longer. If you're only gonna put one part on here, you can break this loose and break it so you only have this much sticking out and you only use a few bushings. So if you're gonna do nothing but this type of pin, you can adjust it there. So I really do like the ones that are adjustable better, okay? So that was on those two. Now, this is a different type like I was looking at here. It has to go in here and it's threaded on there. I kind of like the way it fits on and works. I like, and it runs nice and through. So all of them don't have any problems. The only thing that you can do to mess this up is you messing them up by putting too much pressure on. Now, and I'm gonna show you why it will mess up here in just a second. Okay, let me slap this one on. This one we're gonna do, put it in the headstock. Let me clear this stuff out of the way. All right. Now, to go on the end to your pin over here, you have a couple of choices. My preference is use the regular live center. 
I put the live cylinder in here, I bring it up, there's a, a round part on here, a little hole. That indents and it holds it perfectly straight there where you know you're straight. Now I have not tightened these up on purpose yet, but the other method is using uh, a mandrel saver. This is the whole thing, it's called your pin mandrel. This is a mandrel saver. You don't put the nuts on here, there's a hole on here where you put this right onto the end and that holds all your pressure by using your tailstock to hold it against here. So you don't need to use all this and you're not messing this up. Now I've never messed up a mandrel that way, but I have messed up the point of these several times. If you look at the point on there, it's a real sharp point. If you put this digging into here over and over again after time, this becomes jagged. And if it comes jagged, it causes you a couple problems. One, it's not fitting in there, but another one is the points on here that have all the wood chemicals on it from exotic woods and stuff. I've hit my elbow on here and make a scrape with that. And it took about two months for it to heal just because of the scrape. And I think it's because of the chemicals that are in the wood. So I sand this one over and made it nicer, but now it doesn't make such a good fit in here because it's not pointed as well as that. So, you know, if you put it on here, you just be aware that they're gonna wear down. Sometimes you have to clean them up. You can take this to the sand, you know, clean it up so it's not round like that and it'll work. Mandrel saver solves all that problem. You put it on, you're not messing up this, you're not messing up that. So it's really a mandrel saver, they ought to call it a live center saver because that's what it's saving for me. All right, so I'm gonna use that one on here. Bring these up closer. Okay, now I bring this up, bring this up here and there's no pressure on it now, then I tighten it up. After I got tight a little bit like that, that's when I go out there and tighten up these nuts. You don't want to tighten up this nut without having the tension on there or you will bowl this thing. You know, if you tighten this up and on here and you don't have this on here where it has room where it's just kind of bending, tighten it where to go, you'll put a bend in here. And once you put a bend in it, you can't really straighten it out and have it run through. You want to be able to get it to run through so every time you go to cut the, the pin on here, you know, you're hitting completely parallel with the bed like you want it on here. So. Anyway, the second nut that I put on, just so it doesn't back off, I turn up my finger so I'm tight here as much as I can. I take this and I just snug it up just a little bit. That usually is enough to keep it there. There's no chance it's going to come loose while I'm turning it. Okay, the next step is to put this out here, you're on here. Now, I'm usually a little lower, which is kind of not conventional, but I'm a little bit lower than the actual mandrel itself where I put on my, my tool rest here. Okay. When you get ready to turn these, you can turn this pin blank with just about whatever you want. My favorite that I normally use is a skew. When I first started uh, turning, I went over to a place and said, I need a tool for turning pins. And they ended up bringing out this next one. This is what they told me I needed for turning this little itty bitty pin blank. I thought, you're nuts. But when you think about it, when you take a skew, you are kidding from one point to the other here. Yeah. Okay. All right, this is what I ended up getting for there. They said this is a better tool than using small bow gouges and whatever you can use in, in a skew. If you take a skew, you're gonna put that on there and you, got, you wanna use this sweet spot right in the middle. You don't wanna hit this point, you don't wanna hit that point, so it gives you a smaller area to work with. And I've used a skew a lot on that, so I'm, I'm used to it and I really do like that. That's, that's what I usually use this time. But I'm gonna show you how to rough it out and everything starting with the spindle roughing gouge. Because you are doing spindle turning when you're on here because the axis you're on. So let me uh, get ready to start here. All right, so the next step is to mark, make this thing, get it round and there. Now, on a lathe, about the only thing you're really gonna hurt yourself unless you drop your tools or you get something on there is get your fingers caught in between the two here. So if you can avoid that, you're better off with, one thing you have to watch for, when you do a pin, as big as this blank is, it's only gonna be seconds. When you're from, this thing is round and your distance is, is bigger here. So just keep your fingers out of there. You can easily put your hand in between here just a few seconds after you start. But, and I'm not gonna redo it. The reason I don't redo it, I'm used to it being at a certain spot when I'm going across here. And then when I'm done with it, I don't want to redo it and move this closer and then get used to being there again. So I just work from this part there. I normally turn a pin at the fastest rate that the lathe goes. All right, we're gonna go ahead, get started here. I got the lathe turned up on high. 
Okay. You can look at it for a second. All right. We'll keep finishing up. I think we're good all the way there. We're going to go ahead and sand it next. Okay. For sanding it, this is the order that I use to sand it. You can use whatever method you want. I start off with 150, 180, 220, 320, 400, triple E, then micro mesh, and then sanding sealer, friction polish, and then put wax on the end. I do that on just about every pin except for something that's acrylic. So. So let me start off with a 150. And I will remove the tool rest. I don't need none of this in my way for this. Okay. When I first put it on, I kind of cup it in the back of my hands. I hold it on my fingers to hold it straight. That way I'm trying to get rid of any high spots and stuff first. And then I'll maneuver it to a different shape afterwards. So the first sanding is get rid of the tool marks. And then after that, we're going to use finer sandpaper to get rid of the grits from the bigger sandpaper down here. Okay. Now, when you first start sanding on here, you're going in a circle. So you're going to have lines around there. So what you want to do is you want to break those lines up. Just take and go back and forth like this and get rid of the radial lines. And then you go on to the next sandpaper. Now, the first one I did the shaping with, after this, all you're doing is going over for a couple seconds on each one. Doesn't take long at all to sand the whole pin. Get up to speed. Okay, that's 220. This is 320. And now we're at 400. Okay, the next step is the triple E. Get a good shot of that. Now this has got a fine grit in it. You want to turn your speed down when you put it on so you're not throwing this stuff all over you. If you listen close, you can hear the grid in there. Well, if you could hear it over the lathe.
Okay, what I'm doing is I'm going over finding clean spots on here. It's kind of an oily base product and I don't want it on the micro mesh. Okay, now going through the micro mesh, it goes from 1500 to 12,000 on here. I just number them as one, two, three, so I don't have to remember the whole numbering system. And it only takes a minute or so to go through the whole stack. You want to do it pretty fast. You don't want to leave it on there long. You don't want to press on it hard because you'll heat up the adhesive that's holding your abrasive part of there and then mess it up. The micro mesh makes such a fine finish after a while, you know, you could probably just leave it without putting any polish on and it, uh, it really brings out the oil and stuff in the wood. It looks nice. All right, and this is the last one here. Okay, now I'm going to use a sanding sealer on it, and then I'll use a friction polish. Okay. Shake them up after they've settled. And okay. I try and make almost a tray of this thing so I can hold it in there and you keep it from throwing all over everything. And I usually put it on by hand to start it and get it started and then I'll turn the speed up. Now this dries by the friction itself. You know the first one sanding sealer and then they call it the friction polish. But it dries all the way right at this step. You don't have to spray something on and wait for it. And your paper towel gets nice and hot. Okay, I'm going to put the friction polish on here and I do it the same way. And I usually put a couple coats of the friction polish on. That's going to be your main protection. Okay, at this point you want to hold it till you can't stand it much more. You really need to get it hot. If you don't get the heat on there enough, it's not going to dry all the way. If you can feel it being tacky or something when you're done, you know, you're, you haven't quite done your job yet. Okay, the last step I'm going to do over here is to actually put a wax on. This is Cornova wax. You put it on, you can see where it's dulling it. That's just an extra layer of protection. You don't have to do this, but when you're holding it all the time, the acid and stuff on your fingers, it just gives you one more layer of protection on the, the pin so it lasts a little longer for you. All right. So that's all of it turned. We're going to take it off. We're going to take it over the table and assemble it into an ink pen. Okay, 
Let me take this off of here. I do put an extra nut on here that's not part of a normal mandrel, but I've noticed sometimes you can't get it tight enough on here by your hand, so you put it on there, it keeps your blocks from spinning when they're, before they turn round. Okay, now I'm gonna take these, I set them up over here, on here and then take it to the table. Now, with a single one, it doesn't make any difference which way you put it on, but if you have two pin, two part pin, like a slim line, you want to take both parts off and keep them together. That way the grain matches all the way across. All right, now we're going to come over to here and we'll assemble that. Okay. There's two type of pin presses here. This one, when you get ready to press it on, which will be our last step, you break this loose and move it up back and forth to wherever you want it at. So that's one type. And then the other one that we are actually going to use it's similar to that, but to get the length in here, you just take out a block and then it moves it back and forth to which one you want. So we'll deal with that in a minute. All right, this is a real easy pin to assemble. You take your ink part, stick it inside there with a spring, and this one just tightens on. So you've got it in place. And your next step, you put this one aside. Your next step is just to put the top on. So you can almost do them by hand. They're pretty easy. But you put it on here. Let's take a block out of here. Okay, you've got a little dimple in here. So you usually put that on like a rounded spot there to hold it in place. You want to put it on. You make sure everything's straight. And you just squeeze it in. That's the only step for putting this one on. And this one... You push this in by hand, and then you open and close it. That's it. So you're completely done, and ready to give it away or use it or do whatever you want to do with it. You can see the Celtic knot. We did a material that was like a green, so it does show up. So you can try it with whatever, whatever type you'd like on there. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed the video. Check out our other videos from Gwinnett Woodworkers Association. Have a great day.